Hey everybody, today I want to explain with a little experiment how motorcycle coolant overflow reservoirs work and how the liquid gets back in the system. Bikes like this DRZ 400 SM very often have an overflow tank. I've actually removed mine and replaced it with a turkey baster. That really is a turkey baster that is now acting as my overflow tank. You'll understand how this works and why I was able to do that in a minute. If you don't know how a motorcycle coolant system works, I have a video that explains how water-cooled, air-cooled and oil-cooled works of its own, which I'll put a link up here so you can watch that first. That would be handy to know. This video is kind of a follow-on from that, from people who said, I still don't understand how that overflow tank works and I don't understand how the fluid gets back into the system afterwards. So I'm gonna give you a very quick explanation here and then I'll show you the principle in an experiment and it will prove my point. So, if you imagine that this, oh dear, my pen is not great, is it? So we have a radiator and an engine, which are connected with two hoses, and there is a water pump in the engine. So, obviously air flows through the radiator, which cools down this water. Because of convection, where hot water rises and cold water sinks, depending on their relative positions to each other, uh, the cold water gets pumped, or should we say sucked, in here, because it's got suction from this pump which is causing a suction on this side and a pressure on this side, so that's where you have water pressure in engines. The water then goes up inside the engine, inside the head where the cylinder is, where your piston's going up and down, and the water goes all around the jacket. That's why it's called the water jacket, because there are holes in the top of the engine. If you have a piston there, there are holes around it, you see. Now, some of those are to bolt the engine together, but some of these are for water to flow up and down and cool down that cylinder. So then it gets pumped as hot heated up coolant from the engine back into the radiator, which then gets cooled down and goes back round and round and round. So, you know, it's a closed loop system. You don't want any, any air bubbles in here because that causes your sorts of issues because the air can expand and contract at a different rate to the water. So the reservoir or the overflow tank comes over here. You will have a filler point on your radiator and then the hose will come off of that into a tank and it will connect to the bottom of the tank. That's very important because we can't, we, we ha can't have any air in here. This has to be, have no air in it for it to properly function as I'll show you my experiment in a minute. So let's look at that close up. And this is a bit taller than it would be, but I'm trying to show you a principle here. Imagine this is the top of the radiator and this is the filler tube. Uh, there is another tube off the side here. Now when you put the cap on, it's going to cover the top and it's gonna to have to lock in place tightly. And then there is a central section to that that comes down and there'll be some sort of bung on the bottom, a rounded part or a, a washer that will sit into a seat. And you have to push the cap down against the spring pressure of this spring, which is stopping this from compressing because this can be pushed up. So this tube goes off to your overflow reservoir. When the coolant inside the system gets too hot, so for instance, you're pushing the engine too hard, you're sat in traffic, that's one of the worst ones, being sat in traffic or off-roading and not moving. No airflow means no loss of um, heat. Whether it's air-cooled, water-cooled or oil-cooled, you need airflow to get that thing to cool down. Now, because water or coolant, because it's mostly water, unless it's a waterless coolant, because those expand with temperature, what happens is as the engine heats up, the pressure pushes this up here for a second really, it sort of allows it to let off some pressure. And the hot coolant will go out of here into your reservoir. By doing this means you don't blow a pipe off or blow your radiator open or something like that by it getting too pressurized. Remember that water in a combined, in a, in a small chamber heated is, is a bomb, or if you then take a vent off of that, you can turn it into a steam train. So it's got a huge, huge amount of power there. Water, superheated water, so much pressure is created. So that's how the hot coolant gets into the overflow reservoir. Now the question is, how does it get back? Well, when the bike cools down from you, you know, maybe you get moving so you get good airflow or maybe even turn the bike off. There's normally a, peak, a spike in temperatures as everything heats up for a second uh, as there's no movement of temperature of, of coolant and then it will start dropping off. Now, because the water's density's changed when it gets hot, so it's gone over there because that's extra water because it's become less dense. When this cools down, you get the equivalent of vacuum. Well, it is a vacuum because this wants to contract back to its original density of being, you know, room temperature or ambient temperature, should we say. 
So what that causes is a suction. In the valve, or in the capture we say, there is a very small valve that when it gets a suction on it will allow for this liquid to be pulled back through. Now because there's no air bubbles in it and it filled from the bottom, when it starts pulling back with that suction, it's going to suck the liquid back out of that can through the tube, no matter where it's going through the bike, and then suck it back into the cooling system. And you don't dump any on the road, which is obviously not good for the environment at all. One of the benefits of this is that it doesn't allow it to get on the road. I'm just going to explain this because this is actually very important. If you were to, for instance, allow the bike to get really hot, undo the cap when there's coolant over in this side, and then it goes cool with the cap off, and you refill it, and then you do that a couple of times, uh, by a point, you're gonna keep pumping more and more coolant in until it reaches a point that it would be full. There is a tube coming off the top of it that then becomes an overflow and goes to the ground, but you've gotta lose an absolute ton of coolant in here and then replace it before that overfills, depending on the size of that. Now, the one on the DRZ, the bike I showed you at the beginning with the turkey baster replacement, the quantity of fluid that used to come across and go back, I knew was very small and was a lot less than what goes in a turkey baster. And turkey basters are known for being used for this. Um, so you can reduce the size of this massive catch can I had down to just a hidden turkey baster. And that was on the swing arm as well. Well, it was right at the back of the bike near the swing arm. So it looked horrible too. So it was a great way of removing it, make the bike look cleaner and simplify it with a turkey baster. Anyway, it is important, I should mention, that this can needs to be open to the atmosphere because obviously as the coolant comes over, if this was pressurised, it would get to a point that it couldn't transfer any more over. You now understand how the cooling system works, how the catch can works. As I say, the expansion and contraction of water and the convection is all important in this, the physics of all of that. Uh, thermodynamics, wouldn't it be, actually? So that's why I've put this little experiment together to show you exactly how the overflow tanks work. With It's the same thing, but it's a bottle of water and a, and a syringe. The syringe is going to be showing us the equivalent of the overflow tanks. So we can see the water going up and down in there, which will be the equivalent of coolant. Um, this is the equivalent of our closed loop system in the vehicle, motorcycle, whatever, when the cap is closed. Um, well, actually, technically, it's when the cap's open, because as soon as this warms up, this is going to start expanding, and we should see a difference over this side. It would build up a little bit of pressure, as I say, before that cap pops open, and then it would start allowing fluid to go over. So this ordinarily would be the empty reservoir tank. I'm leaving a little bit of water in there at the one mark so we can see the difference as things change. Uh, you'll be able to see the temperature in the background of the bottle. Obviously I'm going to be blowing some hot air on this with an air gun to heat it up. So we will see a temperature increase a bit higher than the water inside. Okay, so I'm going to start heating the bottle up with a hot air gun. So the point here is that water expands, its density changes as it gets hotter. Its most dense temperature is four degrees C. As it gets hotter, it expands. If it's in a closed box, for instance, it's gonna increase the pressure inside there hugely, which is kind of like the equivalent of a steam engine, apart from they use the steam, the superheated steam coming off of that to power it. So as you can see, as the water heated up, it's expanded and we're now gone from one up to nearly three. And it looks like it's still going. So that is the equivalent of your engine getting very hot and then it expands the coolant into the overflow tank. Now, over time, as, this cool, as the bike cools down when you turn it off or as you're riding along and the radiator gets a better chance at, you know, cooling the bike down. Uh, normally when you get really, really hot bikes is when you're sat in traffic, you're not moving, or you're, you're off-road and you're trying to get up a hill and there's no great air movement over the bike to dissipate that heat, it starts to build up then. If you get going again, it'll go, you know, it'll cool down. So what we can now do is accelerate the equivalent of that bike cooling down by sticking this bottle in some ice water and you then should be able to see the water returning. So we haven't created any extra water or anything, it's just its density has gone down, which means it's expanded. Now, we'll put the bottle in the cold water, and we should be able to watch it drop pretty soon. If it's not airtight, this will not work. 
So I hope my hot glue and super glue is working, <laughs> gonna do the job. Uh, are we dropping? I'm gonna get a few more ice cubes. How much have we dropped? Oh, dropped a little bit. Right, I've got some of these rubbish metal ice cubes. If you wanna know how rubbish these are, I actually have a video doing an experiment with these to see how bad they are compared to ice. As you can see, we're now down to nearly two, and we're, only, we're still at 35C. Don't know, I don't know how much I trust this thermocouple now, although it is pretty warm up there still. been a while I've just turned the bottle upside down to try and get the cold water to go to the top so it mixes properly. As you can see it's now dropping. I tell you what I've learned a couple of things while doing this experiment. One is that trying to get air bubbles out of a line is amazingly difficult. When there's a few air bubbles along the way you can shake it as much as you like and they don't want to move they stick. I used a little bit of dish soap to to lower the surface tension and that, that helped it slip through easier. Um, but I can totally see how air bubbles can get stuck in lines, like brake lines. Uh, and tapping it does make those move along, as does shaking up and down. But it's a bit difficult to do that on a bike. The other thing is I'm amazed how well this hot water is held onto its temperature. It's still 17. One of the disadvantages of my experiment is that I don't have that much water in total that's being heated and cooled. Uh, the more water you have, the more it expands and the more it's noticeable. Uh, with this such a small setup, I have gone for a small syringe, but if I'd gone for something even smaller, this might have been easier to show. But I think that demonstrates my point, as the water warms up, or the coolant warms up, should we say, is going to need to expand. I've explained how the cap works, and I've also got a whole video on how the cooling system works, if you want a bit more information on that. But with a couple of little drawings, a vinegar bottle, a heat gun and some water, hopefully you now understand this system entirely, and you will now not necessarily believe me, because I think some people didn't believe me, um, but understand why it is that the, the coolant can cross over into that tank, why it's there, and how it can return. Even if my system had a bit of an air leak, because it didn't quite get back to the zero point, but well, the one point, but you know. If you found this video interesting or useful, do hit that like button, subscribe if you're new here, and if you want to help support this channel, this is my full-time job, and I mainly make videos to try and help people. If you want to help me do that, then join my Patreon. There are benefits for you to thank you for doing so, like videos early, part of the Q&As, and all sorts of things like that. Oh, and you can talk to me on Discord. And also don't forget I have a playlist called Tips for New Riders which will help you go from having no bike to understanding what licenses you need, how you ride the bike, how to drop a pen, uh, and I also have one on mechanical explanations that explains all sorts of mechanical concepts and things like this or how engines work. One of my most viewed videos is how a motorcycle engine works. Very basic expl explanation, but it tells you all the fundamentals in an easy way. Anyway, bye bye.